Persians went for an easy kill. But the remaining Greek forces had split into two and opened two other fronts against the Persians. Sucked into a bloody slaughter pit, the Persians suffered heavy losses and retreated. For the Greeks, it was a great victory. For the Persians, just a speed bump on their path to world domination. Darius decided to return home and turn his attention to shoring up Persepolis, his capital city. He would never get there. In 486 BC, Darius died on his way to quelling a rebellion in Egypt, leaving behind an empire that redefined the very notions of power and glory. He also prevented a replay of the chaos that followed the death of Cyrus by naming his successor, his son, Xerxes. Now, Cyrus the innovator and Darius the expansionist were very hard acts to follow. But Xerxes had been a king in waiting all of his life. And a couple of his first acts were to suppress a rebellion in Babylon, another one in Egypt. And then he went after the Greeks. Somehow, the Greeks just stuck in his craw. Some historians argue that Xerxes was making a preemptive strike. Others say that he was just cleaning up the business of his father. Whatever the case, the Greeks were no longer intimidated or impressed by the Persians since they'd beaten them at Marathon. And so Xerxes buddied up with the Carthaginian Navy and the tip of what is now modern Tunisia, and he decided to beat the Greeks at sea. Discovered in 1931, Persepolis is one of the last archaeological excavations that dates back to the ancient world. Four eighty B.C. The Persian Empire is at its peak, vast, immensely powerful, and incredibly rich. It's been ten years since the Greeks defeated Darius the Great at the Battle of Marathon. His son Xerxes is now the latest absolute monarch in Persia's Achaemenid dynasty, and Xerxes wants revenge. Greece is only beginning to emerge as a force to be reckoned with, a coalition of profoundly different city-states, from democracies to dictatorships. They are united only by one creed, their hatred of Persia. The ancient world is on the verge of the Second Persian War. The outcome will lay the foundation for the modern world. Greeks uh, traditionally called everybody except themselves barbarians. So this whole thing really uh, between East and West started probably with the Persians and the Greeks and continued ever since. The Persian invasion of Greece would be one of the greatest collaborations of strategy and engineering in military history. The massive invasion would be a complex land-sea assault demanding some astonishing feats of engineering. Xerxes wanted his forces to enter Greece at the Isthmus of Mount Athos, but the seas there were so turbulent, the king directed his builders to dig a canal across the Isthmus. With vast manpower and expertise in canal engineering, Xerxes' engineers took a mere six months to complete the canal across the Isthmus. But the next challenge facing his generals and architects was even greater. The huge Persian army still had to cross the one and a half mile wide Hellespont. To this day, their solution is considered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever conceived for a military campaign. Borrowing a page from his father's book, Xerxes ordered a double pontoon bridge built across the Hellespont. A feat of engineering that would far surpass the bridge Darius built at the Bosporus. But what's very interesting is that 674 ships were now lined up. How were these ships kept stable? This must have been quite an engineering feat. The Bosporus is not a very calm area. It can be quite choppy. The row of ships were kept in place with a very taut system of cables, probably two large cables that ran between Asia and Europe. Now remember, 
a large number of troops cross this bridge, perhaps up to 240,000 troops. The ropes allowed the boat sufficient flexibility of movement in the turbulent waters. Each section of the bridge was built on two boats connected by planks, so the entire roadway could ride the waves, absorbing much of the surface choppiness. Persian engineers then constructed a platform across the top of the boats, then the roadway on top of that. With each wood plank, a superhighway emerged, crossing the Hellespont using battleships as the foundation. Remember, we're dealing with the hooves of tens of thousands of cavalry, including armored cavalry, which would have been much, much heavier. The ships were amazingly kept stable, so this allowed Xerxes to cross with his army into Europe and cross back when he needed to, and the ships were kept in place. And for a short period, Europe and Asia were one. 10 days later, with his bridge complete, Xerxes marched into Europe. The whole army crossed with heavy equipment, heavy cavalry, and the planks were kept in place. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. Xerxes' strategy was simple. Overwhelm the Greeks on land and at sea with superior numbers. Once again, the Greeks were led by the great general Themistocles. He knew he couldn't beat Xerxes on land, so the entire campaign was designed to lure the Persian navy into a trap. In August of 480 BC, the two armies met at a spot chosen by the Greeks, Thermopylae, a mountain pass so narrow only one chariot at a time could get through. For days, the massive Persian army was stalled, bottlenecked on the wrong side of the pass, just as the Greeks planned. In the meantime, Unseen by the Persians, Themistocles left with most of his army, leaving only a token force of 6,000 Spartans behind. Like his father before him, Xerxes was about to charge headlong into a Greek trap. When they finally broke through the narrow pass, the Persians easily destroyed the meager Spartan force Themistocles had left behind as bait and marched toward Athens. But when Xerxes reached the city, Athens was deserted. Xerxes suspected he had been duped and would make the Athenian people pay for it. For generations, tolerance for their vanquished had been the hallmark of Persian kings. Not this time. In a very un-Persian-like act, Xerxes burnt Athens to the ground. The Persian king regretted it immediately and the following morning ordered Athens rebuilt. But it was too late. The deed was done. His moment of rage would come back to haunt Persia nearly 200 years later. But this war was still far from over. At the same time, Themistocles was setting his trap that lured the massive Persian navy into the narrow bay at Salamis. Then he unleashed a surprise attack. The huge Persian fleet was caught in the naval equivalent of gridlock. They couldn't maneuver in the tiny bay. While the Greeks used their heavy triremes as battering rams to demolish the Persian ships. It was a decisive victory for the Greeks. Xerxes returned home defeated, king of a Persian empire that was no longer invincible. There is one high note in the Persian loss against the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis. One sage